My name is Professor Andy Smith. Um, I'm Professor of English Studies at the University of Glamorgan and I'm the award tutor for the MA in Gothic Studies. I want to give a, a very short talk uh, today entitled um, Count Dracula's Joke. I'll come to why I want to talk about that in a moment, but first I just wanted to acknowledge something about the Gothic, which is that there is a tendency to view the form as dealing in fantastical expressions of monstrosity and fear. And actually what's required of us as critical readers of the Gothic is to probe a little deeper than that, to actually explore what it is that's encoded within those kinds of images. And by doing that, we get a sort of sense of what kind of political or historical dramas are going on within those texts. A novel like Dracula is exemplary in that respect because it contains within it writers and readers. What's important is the vampire hunters are not just producers of texts, they're readers of texts. And actually what becomes crucial to how they read texts is that they read them as Gothic texts and therefore they understand the hidden images which are encoded within particular types of discussions and representations. I want us to look at a moment where Jonathan Harker describes what takes place after he has discussed with Count Dracula the house that he wants to sell Dracula, which is Carfax and its surroundings. And he's shown in Kodak camera photographs and various documents that relate to that. The Count, on, after having received this description of Carfax, responds in this way. And he notes, Harkin notes that of the Count, the Count says to him, I am glad, this is about the house, I'm glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day. And after all, how few days go to make up a century? I rejoice that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles have not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety, nor mirth, nor the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters which please the young and gay. I am no longer young, and my heart, through weary years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken, the shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow, and will be alone with my thoughts when I may. Crucially, Harker notes of this, somehow his words and his looks did not seem to accord, or else it was the case that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine. He knows that the Count is having a joke at his expense, but he doesn't know why. Later on, the joke becomes clear because the subsequent readers of his text actually see within it that the Count has given himself away as a vampire. It includes within it various references about how he is not part of the common dead. He is, after all, the dead undead vampire. Also, how it is that he doesn't seek the sunshine because he will lose his powers during daylight. How he doesn't like sparkling waters because he can't cross running water unaided and how it is ultimately that he seeks to live in the shadow and the shade, as well, of course, mentioning how long, how brief it is, uh, a period of time that makes up many centuries. He's talking from personal experience. So the strange thing is, in the Count's joke, he actually gives himself away as a vampire. But Harker doesn't get it, and he's not meant to get it. Dracula doesn't intend that Harker is going to survive. But his document does, and people read that document, and they read it gothically. That's what's important, that they actually get beneath that series of strange references to see within it that it includes a series of truths about how the Count is actually a vampire. Now, whilst we as critical readers might want to move beyond that in order to decode what it is the vampire, if you like, encodes at the end of the 19th century, nevertheless, as a sort of reading practice, it is something that actually we do need to critically emulate as we as also, when we're engaging with Gothic narratives, get below those surface representations of fear and monstrosity in order to decode what it is that's really going on within these stories. Thank you.